Thank you. It's great to present in both Speech Pathology Week and also Brain Injury Awareness Week on this topic. So it was just the stars aligning that those two weeks came together. Um, so to start by introducing myself, um, I'm a PhD student working on this project called TBI Connect. Um, I'm supervised by Professor Leanne Tor and Dr Emma Power. And the focus of this project is exploring the use of telehealth to provide social communication skills training to people with traumatic brain injury and their communication partners. Uh, so in terms of this presentation, I'll be talking you through um, some of the background um, to this project in terms of where it emerged from, from some of the issues I was having in clinical practice. Um, I'll be filling you in on some of the results of one of our preliminary studies and I'll be um, giving you uh, an update in terms of where the study is up to at the moment. Can you just keep going? I'm just going to give it. Okay, I'll just go next slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes. Oh, that was too many. Uh, that, so, yeah, so basically, this is the, the origin story of this, what sometimes feels like a monstrous project. Um, and as I mentioned, this project really emerged in my experiences in working in um, community brain injury rehab. So, to ill. Uh, so I don't have the animations, that was meant to animate, to, to make it a little bit more dramatic. But anyway, basically what I tended to find in my typical day um, working in community brain injury is that things would not go according to plan. So as you can see here on this typical day, uh, at 9 o'clock I might have had a home visit. Often in community brain injury speech pathology you've got um, quite, a, um, quite a lot of travel involved in terms of covering quite a large geographical area. So. That is an issue that we contend with. Uh, so that, uh, sorry, that's thrown me that the animations aren't working. So basically, yes, nine o'clock a home visit with a lot of travel involved there. 11 o'clock an appointment uh, where the client uh, FTAs, they forget to attend, which is often the case with some of our um, clients with brain injury, that memory and organization in terms of getting to appointments can be an issue. Two o'clock, I've got another client appointment. Um, unfortunately, you know, if, even though I plan perhaps a, a 50 minute session, this client fatigues after about 20 minutes and so we need to finish things um, early in that particular session. Uh, at three o'clock, I've got another client appointment, uh, but uh, in, in that case, it's some transport issues on the client's end that uh, mean that we don't quite have as much time as we planned for therapy. And the last point, the, sorry, the last appointment of the day at four o'clock. Um, so for that particular uh, time slot, the client attends. Um, but in working with him, I realised that perhaps you know there's a need to provide his wife with some communication strategies. Unfortunately, she works full time, and so it's often an issue in terms of um, yeah being able to meet with her and provide those supports. Um, sorry, next slide. Um, okay, so. I guess in terms of my, my, uh, my work here, I started to consider what might we gain by using telehealth. So I guess uh, one benefit could be, you know, cutting out that travel, which might open up space to, to see new clients, as well as cutting down perhaps some of those issues around being late for appointments and needing to allow that travel time in Sydney traffic. Um, in terms of my 11 o'clock appointment, you know, perhaps that would increase attendance rate if you can you know, just call the, point, uh, call the client at the time of the session and um, even though they, perhaps in this instance, um, you know, perhaps he had forgotten but was still available and happy to go ahead with the appointment. In terms of our two o'clock appointment, um, perhaps telehealth could be a way of managing some of those fatigue issues and still providing um, a, a good dose of therapy but spreading it out across the week. Uh, three o'clock again, the travel issues are, are minimised there. And in terms of that four o'clock appointment, perhaps that would be an option um, in, in terms of providing the wife with some more supports. Perhaps she's finished her work at four o'clock and can join in with the, the video conferencing session. So, yeah, so I guess potentially there's quite a few wins that can be achieved by replacing face-to-face -face services with telehealth in some of these instances. Um, but I also started to think about what we might lose by using telehealth. So I had some questions about by using telehealth, would there be a loss of the rapport or trust that you build up with families that's so important? Would it perhaps be more difficult to pick up on subtle cues, which are often quite important in brain injury in terms of some of the social communication issues? Uh, would we lose some of the broader context if we're not actually physically going out to visit families in their home? 
and specifically with brain injury, you know, what would be the issues in terms of managing some of the cognitive aspects around attention and motivation and comprehension, all of those sorts of things. So to answer some of these questions about what might be gained and what might be lost, we embarked on this TBI Connect study. Um, so the first study in this project, we were looking um, specifically at um, assessments, so the reliability of communication assessments via telehealth. Um, we did use Skype um, as the mode for this study. So for, um, uh, to, to answer these questions, we recruited 20 participants with brain injury and their communication partners across both metropolitan and regional New South Wales. Um, most had used Skype before, at least once or twice. Um, but weren't particularly frequent users. So all of these participants completed the same assessment protocol twice, once, over, once during a home visit and once over Skype. And these participants were randomised to the order of assessment. So some did the home visit first and then Skype, some did Skype first and then the home visit. So we thought that after these two appointments, these, um, this group of participants were actually in quite a, a good position to reflect on their experiences and compare you know, what was different about telehealth versus face-to-face. -face. So to, I guess, tap into their experience and their knowledge, we um, conducted semi-structured qualitative interviews with these people, focusing on questions like, what did you think about using telehealth? And, you know, what do you think about the pros and cons? We transcribed those interviews verbatim and then um, classified participant quotes into categories. So moving on now to the results. So just to break it down into numbers, when we sort of put people into groups according to whether they preferred in-person assessment versus video conferencing based assessment or if they had no strong preference, across the board for both the people with brain injury and their communication partners, we found about a third of people really still preferred that in-person service. But then about half really had no strong preference either way. They were pretty easy going, happy either way. Um, and then roughly about 20% actually preferred video conferencing, that they felt that would actually have some advantages for them. So moving now onto some um, more of the qualitative feedback that we got to sort of explain those preferences. So I'll start with some of the positive responses people had to um, the idea of using video conferencing. I guess there was a spectrum here, but, uh, starting firstly from people who really preferred in person, but still felt that video conferencing was better than nothing. Moving up then to people who felt, as I said, that it was basically equivalent to an in-person session. The quote here, you know, doesn't really matter to us either way, makes no difference. And then there was that other group, as I mentioned, that felt that the video conferencing had some advantages over in-person services. So in terms of what some of those advantages might be, um, people described perhaps positive effects on communication. So some people felt it was actually easier for them to focus on the computer and, and kind of felt it was more interactive and more engaging for them. So a comment from a younger gentleman here, he said, you know, I think I was able to concentrate more here. Basically, you know, I'm talking to a computer, it's just cool. Uh, people also described that perhaps there could be some positive effects on the actual therapy process in terms of engaging um, clients uh, in the therapy. Um, a few comments were made around perhaps video conferencing being perceived as more normal than having to go into the hospital for their appointments. It was more private from the community because it could be accessed at home. And for some people, they felt it actually would be less upsetting for them than having to go in and visit the brain injury service again and again, week after week. So some comments that illustrate that, you know, I'd likely uh, contact my health professionals more often if I could do it over Skype. Chatting to someone on Skype is a bit more normal uh, for the average person than going to a therapy session. In terms of some of the positive aspects that people describe, people reported feeling comfortable, that it was easy to use and worked well. And there was also a thought that perhaps learning to use telehealth could perhaps lead to other social benefits in terms of providing more communication opportunities. You know, if they learn Skype, perhaps there's some opportunity for them to communicate with others as well. Moving now into the, the negative side of things. So um, firstly here, I guess we've got here some reasons that people actually prefer going to the brain injury service for their appointments. There was a sense that people could be more focused. So face-to-face -face is better because, you know, it's a whole brain thing, you know, it's a whole mind thing. I'm going to go to rehab again. I've got to switch on and try to do what they tell me. Privacy was an issue that people mentioned in terms of, you know, if you're video conferencing at home, perhaps others in the household are going to overhear you. Um, and this last point here I think is important. You know, for a lot of our clients with brain injury, 
going to the brain injury service is actually, you know, a social outing in itself that's important to them and it, um, you know, provides communication opportunity. So we wouldn't want to take that away from them. Uh, so people then, you know, did describe some negative effects on the communication with the clinician. A lot of people said it felt less personal. Um, they described problems managing the conversation, you know, in terms of audio breaking up and delay, which we are experiencing here today. Um, and people did feel that nonverbal communication was not as easy, that, you know, there was more that you could gauge from actually being physically with a person versus being over Skype. Uh, people did also describe some risks in terms of negative effects on the therapy processes, so risks of telehealth becoming a shortcut. Um, you just have to double check that you're not using Skype as a means to get more visits into a day when you actually do need to go and see the people. Uh, people felt there was a risk that clinicians might miss information. You know, it's doing Skype, it's not going to give you the same qualitative stuff as face-to-face. -face. And there was seen to be a problem in not being able to access physical resources in the same way that you might if you're in the same clinic room together. In terms of some negative comments, in terms of people's experiences, people did report some discomfort in terms of feeling apprehensive that it did take time to learn how to use. And of course, some technical problems, again, as we've experienced today. Okay, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. So just some tips in terms of what our families recommended to clinicians about how to plan successful telehealth services. So of course you need to consider whether it's appropriate for the client and family in terms of their severity of injury, their motivation, what stage they're up to in their rehab, how confident they are with technology, those sorts of things. There's a need to manage the home environment in terms of making sure people aren't distracted and that they do have a quiet private space for the video conferencing session. Uh, people did feel it was really useful to meet with the clinician first before, um, so meet in person first before using Skype. They did find it helpful to have hard copies of things, not just to have everything on the computer, to have some paper copies of what was being discussed. And they felt like it was important to have a pre-arranged backup plan. Uh, and the last point here that, that people um, commented on was that it wasn't just a, a one-off decision, that whether to use telehealth or face-to-face, -face, that it was something that needed ongoing evaluation and discussion about whether telehealth is appropriate and adequate. Um, so that discussion needs to continue between the therapist and the family. So in conclusion, you know, there's, I guess these qualitative um, interviews with our families kind of threw up a whole range of factors that can be considered in terms of making that decision of should we meet or should we video conference? Got things like families' preferences, what's the impact on communication and engagement with therapy, uh, what might the client miss out on in terms of social contact and social engagement, what might the clinician miss out on in terms of important clinical information, um, is the purpose of the session able to be achieved using telehealth, how is it fitting in with overall goals, is the technology reliable enough, is the person cognitively able to engage, do they need training, uh, what pre-planning can be done to set up telehealth therapy to be as effective as possible and, you know, how are we going to evaluate and do that ongoing discussion about whether telehealth is adequate. So, uh, briefly, just to give you an overview of where we're up to, so what I've described today is that assessment study where we um, looked at um, reliability of assessment and also got that qualitative feedback. Where we moved to next was that intervention pilot, which was a single case study of social communication skills training over Skype. And we're now at the stage of uh, intervention NRCT, comparing in-person with Skype social communication skills training. Only one more participant needed to uh, complete our sample size of 36. So I'm hoping that we'll get there soon and um, be able to finish up recruitment for this study. Um, in terms of the questions we'll be looking at with this um, NRCT, we'll be looking at things like um, the communication outcomes and comparing those between telehealth and in-person and in intervention. We'll also be looking at clinician-client rapport and again collecting people's qualitative feedback about what people think about using telehealth. And that's it for me. Thank you.